And finally, I argue that um, the demise of maternalism would help pave the way for the emergence of a more individualist, liberal, liberal feminism that emerged in the 1960s. And so I end the book with um, a reassessment of Beth for Dan, um, looking at how uh, she actually incorporates a lot of the kind of anti-maternalist sentiments that had been percolating around. And then I do a reading of two groups of letters that she received, women who read the book, and then women who encountered her by reading an article in Cosmo magazine. And that latter group, people haven't really focused on, and they were overwhelmingly negative letters, and they were often, the reason why they responded so negatively was because they interpreted her um, not as uh, you know, launching a sort of clarion call for equal rights, but as attacking domesticity and motherhood. So I try to put those sources into dialogue with one another and show how, even though it wasn't politicized yet, those two positions, you can see already in the early 60s, that polarization that is going to happen with the rise of the new right. OK. Um, so. <laughs> uh, this is from Mother's Day of 1942. Okay, so uh, not long after Pearl Harbor, the, well, I should explain um, what follows is drawn from the second chapter of my book, the part that um, actually focuses on the war mothers. So you were very right on to reference that, that component. Um, not long after Pearl Harbor, the writer Philip Wiley sat down at his typewriter and began to pound out a new book detailing everything he thought to be wrong with his fellow Americans. And he was about halfway done with the manuscript when he attended a party in Miami at which he heard a fellow writer expressing a fine and funny fury over a recently viewed, viewed newsreel. And the film depicted an infantry division of American soldiers spelling information the word mom as a tribute to Mother's Day, a spectacle that prompted the viewer to conclude there is too much mom in America. Um, so Wiley had already planned at this point to include a treatise on matriarchy in his forthcoming book, but that anecdote provided his hook. As he later explained, mom was the word I needed, and mom spelled out by 10 or 15,000 soldiers was the proper scale. Momism was a natural derivative to describe the unconscious and abnormal piety of the popular mind. And when his book appeared, Generation of Vipers, um, it became a surprise bestseller, and the term momism entered the popular lexicon. So why did that vision um, speak so strongly to him? What did it symbolize, or why did it symbolize something so badly amiss that he actually needed a new word to describe it? So, just... so these, I don't have that newsreel. I couldn't find it. I actually looked before. But um, I did find these images from Life Magazine in 1942, which I think provide some insight into what was troubling him. Um, so the regiment's willingness to bow to motherhood, to participate in a sentimental exercise at odds with military prowess, um, suggested to him an appalling lack of masculine fortitude. Moreover, it conveyed the threat of mass minds in lockstep conformity. <laughs> Viewed from above, the soldier looked, you know, reduced to an insignificant speck, as if the act of mothering required male identities to be both blurred and submerged. So by tacking a sinister ism onto mom, this um, relatively new, it dates from like 1909, and at first uniquely American um, term of endearment, Wiley succeeded in linking antagonism toward mothers to the political fears of the moment. And you don't hear that term, momism, today much, right? My students don't even, they don't know what I'm talking about. So, um, but it was in common parlance for uh, at least 20 years. And as Wiley and other critics deployed it, momism was, was both a familial and a social pathology. It referred to this supposedly archetypical middle class American mom who henpecked her husband and dominated her son, but it also referred to a societal condition in which the nation as a whole had been drained of masculine vigor. So that, um, and then here are the other 
pictures from that um, <coughs> that teacher. They actually crowned <laughs> Mrs. Covington, your mom, <laughs> and um, you know she has on her collar a, a miniature that shows her connection to a long tradition of male military sacrifice, which is crucial. So um, that GIs honored mothers in such a fashion and that they're doing so led to scathing social commentary says, mo says much about both the persistence of and the growing resistance to sentimental notions of motherhood in American culture. During World War I, the soldier's mother had been the predominant representative of American womanhood in propaganda, popular culture, patriotic ritual, his virtuous devotion to her signaled his willingness to sacrifice for the larger national cause. And this is just some of these are World War I posters. Um, and she's always portrayed in this kind of way that looks almost more like a grandmother, really, to, to us today. She's always white. She always has um, kind of gray hair or white hair. So, um, in contrast, during World War II, images of young American homemakers and glamorous pinup girls crowded out those of uh, middle-aged moms. Sentimental images of war mothers did not disappear. Here's one, for example. But they surfaced um, with less frequency and considerably less pathos. And to the extent that the all-American mom remained a potent icon, critics like Wiley increasingly portrayed the public's reverential attitude, either as cause for satirical attack or as evidence of a serious national failing. So they either debunked her as ludicrous or demonized her as a real menace, and Philip Wiley does both. So we can start by observing that in World War II, Americans were less inclined than they had been in World War I to conflate devotion to the nation with devotion to one's mother. Um, they were also less likely to uh, attempt to mobilize patriotic feelings through maternal imagery or to envision the American mother as a symbol of the virtuous, virtuous nation itself. So why? Why did she lose her privileged position within national iconography? what happened in the intervening years to make her a less convincing symbol of national unity. Those are some of the kinds of questions I try to ask in that second chapter. So um, here I'd like to suggest that um, we start by looking at changes in two broad areas, women's relationship to politics and the norms, changes in the norms that govern displays of emotional affect or affectivity. Um, so to start with first, women's relationship to the state, as Linda Kerber and others have shown, since the founding of the Republic, white women's civic status has been defined in largely derivative terms, meaning that they were understood to derive their civic identity through their relationship to men, primarily through husbands. They did not serve the state directly by taking up arms, voting, or serving on juries. They did so indirectly by being virtuous Republican wives and mothers. Um, Kerber has also argued, I think very um, convincingly, that one way we can view American history or the history of American women over the, well, over the entire course of the nation state is to look at the sort of painfully slow process by which um, we've chipped away at the tradition of coverture, how step by step women gradually acquired a civic status more as individuals rather than as wives and mothers. And so I am basically kind of building on that argument and um, suggesting that as women were gaining more rights as individuals, they are also facing pressure from some quarters to relinquish their claims to influence as wives and mothers. Um, once women achieved suffrage nationwide, they did not suddenly abandon maternalist rhetoric or their separate women's associations. In fact, the tradition of female associational activity really thrived in the interwar period. Uh, but such arguments resonated quite differently in a new political context. It's one thing to appeal to male legislator, legislators as a mother when your only real weapon is moral authority. 
it's another to make such appeals when one potentially has the power to vote mail.